everyone, it's 10 a.m. So let's go ahead and get started with the webinar. Uh, this webinar is IPM's Demographic and Health Surveys, Working with Geography Variables. I'm Elizabeth Boyle. I'm a professor of sociology at the University of Minnesota and one of the principal investigators on IPM's DHS. And uh, two of my colleagues are with me today, um, actually not physically, but uh, over Zoom. First, we've got Dr. Shula Sarkar, who is a research scientist and expert geographer at the Minnesota Population Center. You want to say hi, Shula? Hi, this is Shula. And we also have Dr. Miriam King, who's the project manager of IPMS DHS and my co-principal investigator on the project. Hello, thanks for joining us. All right, well, thank you very much for being here. Um, the webinar is targeted to folks who have beginning or intermediate level experience with IPMS DHS. And by the end of this webinar, um, the goal is that you'll appreciate how IPMS geographers like Shula harmonize the DHS regions over time. Uh, you'll learn how to recognize and use the different geography variables in IPMS DHS, and you'll understand the value of those variables um, as I walk you through a couple of examples. And then we'll also um, go over uh, some, of the thing, some of the other resources that are available to help you with IPM's DHS geography that we're not covering in depth in this uh, webinar. So today's webinar is especially focused on how to use IPM's geography variables for comparing regions within countries over time. And I'll be discussing how to make uh, informative figures using IPM's DHS data. All right, and we'll also just briefly be touching on where you can find IPM's DHS shapefiles, how to use the IPM's DHS contextual variables, and linking IPM's DHS with IPM's International, but we will not be going into those in depth today. Before we begin, I, wanted, I want to acknowledge our funders and supporters First, the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute for Child Health and Human Development uh, funds the Minnesota Population Center Grant and also directly IPMS DHS. So we're very appreciative of them. And we're also very appreciative of our partners at the DHS program, which is headed by the United States Agency for International Development and is administered by ICF. A little bit of webinar info. So at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A button. Um, please use that if you have any questions. Uh, Shula and Miriam will be able to see your questions and they'll be directing those uh, to me or answering them. Um, and we'll be breaking periodically for Q&A, but you can enter your questions at any time. And uh, of course, you are all muted. That's the way that webinars work. Um, so you won't be able to speak to us directly. I also want to mention that we may get a lot of questions today because we do have a lot of people participating. Uh, and uh, we will be posting a document online that answers questions even if we're not able to get to them today. And that will be available along with a link to this recording of, a recording of this webinar. All right, so today I'm going to introduce you to IPUM's DHS. Uh, talk about harmonized geography in IPMS DHS. We'll have a web tour that features uh, the geography variables but covers all of the basics of how to use IPMS DHS. Um, and then examples of comparisons over time with DHS data. Resources for other geography related analyses with IPMS DHS. And finally, looking ahead. All right, let's start with an introduction to DHS. So most of you who are here probably know what IPMS DHS is, that's why you're here. But uh, just to let you, just to refresh your memories, IPMS DHS is a data dissemination tool for demographic and health survey data. It's micro data, meaning that it's individual records and not aggregate statistics. Um, and it's fully harmonized variables. Now you can get DHS data directly from the DHS program website. So another question you might be wondering if you're a beginner is why use IPMS DHS? So certainly one of the reasons that you would wanna use IPMS DHS is when you're pooling multiple samples. 
And this is because of the harmonized variables, uh, including the harmonized regions, which are one of the um, most valuable things in the data set, I think. And in addition, you get quick access to variable information. Um, for example, uh, you can, with a click, you can see question wording in the, from the survey, who was asked the question, how the question changed over time. Um, so harmonization and variable information is one reason to use IPMS DHS. Um, in addition, IPMS DHS is set up so that it's easy to link to the census data in IPMS International, and it's easy to select certain contextual variables and add them to uh, household or women's records. Um, and so that's another reason why people, I think, use IPMS DHS. We're very pleased with the recent exponential growth in our users, um, and thanks for being part of that. And we do survey our users every year, and we hope you'll take that survey and give us feedback on what you like and what you'd like to see changed, if anything. Um, and you should also feel free to email our helpline at any time um, or to provide, to get help or to provide us with additional suggestions. And that email is ipums at umn.edu. Also, if you use IPMS, just our documentation, or you actually download a data set, um, please cite us. That helps us continue our funding from NICHD. They like to see that people are using the um, tool that we've spent years creating. Okay, so now let's get into the heart of our topic, Harmonized Geography in IPMS DHS. These are the samples and countries that are currently in IPMS DHS. So to date, we have standard continuous and interim DHS surveys for 156 samples covering 38 countries. And this is nearly all of Sub-Saharan Africa, um, particularly uh, Sub-Saharan Africa with samples from countries with more than one survey. Um, but we are in September gonna be adding more of those countries that only have one survey or just a, a small number. We also cover North Africa, the Middle East and South Asia. On this map, you can see the number of samples in IPOMS DHS. Uh, Bangladesh has the most, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, Senegal has the most with 10. Bangladesh and Egypt are in second place with seven each. Um, today, we'll be focusing on Tanzania, which like many other countries has six. Um, so there's a, a lot of opportunity for studying information over time with IPOMS DHS. Let's talk about how spatial harmonization works in IPMS DHS. Um, so these are two maps of Tanzania, one from 1996 and one from 2015. Um, initially, they might look the same, but in fact, the regions have changed over the time period. Up on the north, we see Lake Victoria. And around Lake Victoria, we've had some really dramatic boundary changes. Um, you can see that this region not only um, cuts into other regions, but it basically is completely new boundaries uh, that change the boundaries of every region that's around it. So that is a particularly tricky case. Then we have cases that are a little bit simpler, where um, one region in 1996 becomes two regions in 2015. Um, now, what happens with uh, what Shula does is she uh, creates um, regions that combine these. So let's take a look. When you look here at the gray area, the yellow area, the pink area, and the green area, all of those become one region in the integrated variable. So to facilitate comparisons over time, Shula creates harmonized regions that have an identical geographic footprint. Um, the harmonized geography takes a least common denominator approach. There are fewer regions in the harmonized variable, but they are comparable over time. Uh, and one implication of the least common denominator approach is that you can use standard DHS weights in your analyses, even if you're using the integrated variables. And a really important note is that uh, we can kind of eyeball these maps, and guess which, which regions go together, but uh, Shula does much more than that. She matches the actual geographic boundaries. Um, 
she's not harmonizing here by labels or by just uh, guessing. She's um, actually looking at the um, shape files and uh, helping us make sure that the regions haven't changed over time. Now I want to talk about the geography variable naming conventions in Open's DHS and talk a little bit about when you would want to use uh, one type of variable versus another. So here is the typical look of a single sample geography variable. You have geo underscore the two letter country code and the survey year. If there is a finer level of geography, which isn't always the case, but sometimes is the case, you have a variable that looks similar, but the prefix is geo alt underscore. And finally, for the integrated geography, you've got geo underscore on the two letter country code and then the range of the survey years. In Tanzania, you've got two integrated geography variables from 1996 to 2015, which is what we just saw on the map. But Chul has also created a 1991 to 2015 harmonized geography variable. And that one is much more coarse. It only has six regions. You can choose how far back you want to go. It's generally a trade-off. The further back you go, the coarser the geographic detail. And which geography variable do you want to use? Um, well, if you want to look at change over time, then look at the integrated variable. So for example, you could look at country A's progress on vaccinations since 1995. Um, if you want to look at one point in time, then use the single sample variable that's going to have more detail. Um, so if you were asking about the link between household wealth and stunting in 2016 in country B, uh, you would use the single sample variable. Okay, so now let's take a moment and uh, see if there are any questions yet. Uh, there's a question from our user, one of the users, who asked that DHS location data are displaced. Therefore, how to link the DHS data to census data at lower administrative levels? Uh, I can respond to that. Uh, so what Liz was showing up till now was region data, like uh, the V101 variable. Uh, the question here is location data, the GPS clusters. Uh, well, the good news is uh, we are working on this data and it will be available in the next couple of months. Uh, the bad news is that it is not available right now, but we are working on overlaying the GPS clusters to the administrative level boundaries. Thanks, Shula. Um, okay, well, I'm going to move on to the website. Oh, I'm sorry. We, we do have a couple more questions, if, if we can. Um, uh, we have a question from a user. I think, again, um, this may be for Shula. Um, do we provide shape files for single uh, survey samples, such as Tanzania 2015? Uh, yeah, I can take that. Uh, thanks for asking this. Uh, we do not provide shape files for single sample years. Uh, just because they are redundant information and available from the spatial data repository uh, uh, site provided by the ICF. So we only provide shapefiles for the harmonized variables, but not the single sample years. And uh, if anyone missed the name or anything, we can put this uh, in a Q&A document and uh, post it to all the users. So all this information will be there um, again. Um, we also have a question. Um, if someone wants, uh, I'm going to read it directly so we get all the detail. Um, so if someone wants a harmonized variable for say 1995 to 2016, but there was a change in boundaries in say 1998, can we choose whether we want the boundaries from before 1998 or after? Um, I, I can respond to that. Uh, good question. Uh, we try to do as many iterations as we can. So we are presuming that, like Liz showed two variations. Liz, can you go back to that page where you yes. have the variable sure. naming convention for Tanzania? 
So here we have a 1991 to 20, 2015, because there possibly was a boundary change between 1991 to 1995. And then there is another version from 1996 to 2015. So this was another set of uh, boundary changes. So if there weren't any boundary changes, then we wouldn't make another one, let's say from 2000 to 2015, if that makes sense. Uh, I also have to say that uh, we are at 10.15, so Liz, uh, we can maybe proceed with the webinar and then we could answer the other questions. Right. We can go back. We'll have some more Q&A um, periods, so um, we may be able to fit some of your questions in a little later. Yes, okay. Thank you. Now I'm gonna go to uh, change my screen share so that you can see the website. And let's go to, just one second here. IPMS DHS. Okay, um, so this is the IPMS DHS homepage. Uh, and let me just show you a couple of different things here. So uh, first on the homepage, I wanna show you that we've got a help link up here. And this is where you'll be able to access a recording of this webinar later and also get other kinds of help information. There's also a link to my data, and that's where you can find your data extracts, which is very useful when you um, have created a data extract and all you wanna do is add one more variable to it rather than um, starting from scratch and remaking the whole extract. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Over on the left here, we also have some important information. Uh, down at the bottom here, we have um, how to cite IPMS DHS, and our citation is constantly updating um, as we update the data. And so it's important that you find the most recent citation information here so that other people can replicate your findings. Up at the top, we've got information on the contextual variables. This is another place where you can find and revise your data. But today I want to jump in here to information on IPMS DHS geography and GIS boundaries. So you may find um, this information, background information helpful. And uh, although we don't have the individual level shape files, we have a link to the spatial data repository on the DHS program website. Um, and we do have the shape files for the integrated geography and also for our um, crosswalk geography or linking of files with the census data with IPMS International. All right, now let's go back to the home page. And uh, this is the fun part. Um, we get to create a data extract. So we start by, do it, by clicking Get Data. And the first thing that happens is you choose your unit of analysis. What, you mean by, what we mean by unit of analysis is uh, what's going to be a row in your data file. Uh, and um, what is going to be your focus. So for example, if you're focusing on how many women received antenatal care for their last um, birth, you would click on women. If you want to know how many children received vaccinations in the uh, last so many years, you would pick children or possibly household members. Sometimes um, you can get uh, more children information in the household member file. Today I'm going to focus on women. So we'll click on that. And if I change my mind, I can always change the unit of analysis up here. Next thing I do is select samples. Today I'm going to select samples that are, uh, it's as if I'm constructing a data file that I'm going to be using for a, an example later. And so I'm going to be focusing on Tanzania and I want to pick all of the files to submit sample selections. Now look up here in the data cart. So the data cart, Miriam likes to say, this is like shopping at Amazon. You can um, check out at the end by viewing the cart. Uh, the only difference is that everything is free. So now, right now we've got six samples in the data cart. Uh, all right, the next thing that we do is we select variables. I'm gonna start with a substantive variable decision-making for the example that I'm gonna have later. And just to show you how the variables work. What the X's mean is that this 
variable is available for that particular survey. So we can see that final say on spending women's earning is available for four surveys, which is kind of nice for an overtime analysis. And so I'm going to select that one and put it in my data cart. And at this point, it's going to make me log in. Uh, if you're registered to use the DHS data, then you're already, uh, you can just use your username and password here. Um, if you're not registered, then you can request access to the DHS data and that's going to direct you to the DHS program homepage. So we submit. Uh, now I want to show you how important it is that you see that each of these variable names is a live link to a whole bunch of information. Um, so the first thing that you can see is what kinds of responses were possible and how many people uh, were in each response. So final say on women's spending women's earning, earnings, does the woman decide by herself or does she decide with someone else or does someone else decide entirely? And you can see how that's asked in Tanzania. Um, across the top here, we have more information and I'm just gonna jump into a couple of these because I wanna look over time. I wanna know if the same women were asked this question over time. What I can see is that in 1996, 2004, and 2010, um, the same women were asked this question. Women age 15 to 49 who've worked in the last 12 months for cash or cash and in kind. However, in 2015, it's a slightly different sample. It's women who are currently married or living with a man um, who have those other qualifications. And so I know that when I wanna compare these over time, I'm gonna to have to limit my samples to women who are currently married or living with a man um, if I want to make these comparable. And I can also go in here on the survey text, this is one of my favorite things, and look at specifically how the questions were asked. I'm not going to get into that too much because in fact the question didn't change very much over time. Okay, now I'm going to go back to select data. I have that one variable. And now let's jump into geography. All right. First, you can get the single sample geography. Um, and as I mentioned before, there's two geography variables in Tanzania. These geography variables match the DHS regions, V101, um, and each one of them applies to a particular year. I can also look at integrated geography. Um, and so this is where we find geo underscore TZ 1991 to 2015 and geo score TZ 1996 to 2015. And I want both of those integrated geography variables for my analysis. Okay, now I do view data cart. And um, at the top here, there's a lot of pre-selected variables. What that means is these are variables that we found that people often want but might forget to ask for. So for example, um, you really should have the weight variables in your sample, in your data file. Um, those are super important. Um, it's, you obviously need to have the country and the year. Um, and then these are some popular variables like urban, age, marital status that we found that almost everybody asks for, some really basic demographic things. And at the very bottom, we have the three variables that I just added. Okay, so now we're gonna create the data extract. Um, on this page, what's important is make sure you set your data format where you want it. So I always go in and change the data format so that it will give me a Stata file because I use Stata. And I described the extract. This is an extract for the one. And I submit it. Now we wait just a second here. Then I get to this page. Um, so this is the page that I would see if I click, clicked on my data on the home page as well. Um, and if I want to, this is the um, data set that I'm creating right now. It's processing. In a moment, it's going to have a green button just like this, and it's going to allow me to download my Stata file. If I forgot a variable, oh shoot, I wanted to add another variable to it. I just click on this. I'm going to do that now. And say I want to add a new variable, I just change variables and then I can um, move on from there. Um, 
So that is a, a basic overview of the geography variables. Now I'm going to go back to sharing my screen with you, my PowerPoint, and let's see if there's any questions here. Yes, we, we do have some questions. Um, one question, which is um, well-timed, is um, where can we get information about um, or documentation about the boundary changes? Um, and um, I think um, either Shula or Liz may want to talk about that in terms of the, the comparability section of the um, variable description. Yeah, thank you uh, for bringing that question. I was also going to kind of contemplating uh, interrupting Liz to just show the comparability section uh, in the website. I can go back to that while you explain it, Shula. Um, so in the comparability section of the variable description for any of the geography variables, we list all the changes in boundaries uh, uh, that happened from one sample year to the other. So here, if we go to the uh, Tanzania variables or back to the geography GIS page, maybe. Sure. Oh, you want me to go back to the geography GIS? Yeah. Page? Sure. And then if you scroll down and click on any one of the Tanzania integrated variables. Mm -hmm. Uh, the integrate, yeah, those. And then the comparability tab down here. So here you go, you have all the changes that happened between the census years. And you should be able to get that for all the variables um, that are integrated. Thanks. Right. So if I go back to integrated geography, it'll take me to the variable selection page. And if I click on the other integrated variable, it's going to give me, it starts with the codes, and then it's going to give me a different comparability statement. That's correct. Yeah, that's a great question. Another question is, um, what are the uh, differences and similarities to help you choose between um, the two integrated variables that have a different range of years? I think I can take that one and then maybe you can add on, uh, Shula. But if we go back and we look at, so for example, I picked that decision-making variable and I can see that where the X's are. So here I know that there is no 1991 information on that particular question. And so for this particular question, I'd be interested um, it only makes sense for me to get the geography from 96 to 2015, which is going to give me more detail. But let me give you another example. If you look at demographic information, um, and let's say we look at age at first marriage, which is another example I'm going to give you later. That one goes all the way back to 1991. And so there it might be useful to take the integrated variable from 1991 all the way forward and uh, even though I would have less detail in terms of regions. Anything you wanted to add to that, um, Shaw? Nope. That is exactly where I would have asked you to go to click on that and show. So, yep, nothing to add. Um, another, uh, oh, another question. Um, a few questions sort of in general about IFMS DHS. Um, one is uh, asking whether the um, data comes in uh, for separate files like it does with the original DHS data, um, where, for example, if you want the data on women, you choose the IR data. Um, I'm going to answer that. We do start with um, the original public use files for the DHS, mm -hmm. and um, those different files are reflected in the units of analysis that Liz showed you at the beginning. So if you want to look at the, um, the kids file, the KR file, you choose young children as your unit of analysis. If you want the, the uh, variables and data for women, the IR file, you choose that. And once you're in the website, you can switch between them um, if you change your mind. Um, another um, 
question is, um, uh, is it going to be possible to get a recorded version of this webinar? And the answer is yes, uh, that will be available um, if you click on the support information on the IFMS DHS website, or also if you go to uh, IFMS org under support and under tutorials, you can see all of the different webinars here and it'll be in this list as well. So either the um, help button or support button on IFMS DHS or the uh, general help button. Um, another question was, um, how much time does it take to download the data? And I, I think that depends to some extent on, you know, what your um, computer connection is, um, is like, but uh, maybe you'd like to, to comment on that. Sure. Um, well, you can see that my data file, the data file I just created is already ready. Um, and so that took uh, less than five minutes. Oftentimes, I'll just sit here and refresh a couple times and it'll show up. Um, but yes, it does depend on how much bandwidth you've got. Um, and you will get an email. So if you don't want to sit around and wait for it, um, you can uh, leave this page and then you'll see an email uh, pop up when, you, when it's ready. And that'll link you back to this page. Um, sure All I right, well, maybe we should, oh, maybe we um, should move on. Okay, again, we'll have another Q&A or two, so um, maybe we can get to some more of the questions later. Right. Okay, thank you for those questions. And thank you also as we move through these transitions. Okay, so to summarize, um, in IPMS DHS, you can get single sample and integrated geography. Um, the integrated geography ensures a common footprint across surveys so that they can be compared. We went over the naming conventions for the variables. And you also saw where you can find shape files and more information, um, like a link to the uh, spatial repository at the DHS program website under geography and GIS um, on the IPMS DHS homepage. Okay. So now let me give you a couple of examples of comparisons over time. Um, and let's just say why this is important. So for example, the sustainable development goals call for improvement, not just at the national level, but also among national subpopulations. Uh, being able to see progress within countries by looking regionally is therefore very important, breaking down change within countries. And this is what IFMS DHS Harmonized geography allows you to do. All right, so I want to show you a couple of tables here. On this table, or this figure, is the average age of first marriage of women by region in Tanzania. So um, it goes all the way back from, to 1991 up to 2015, and I suspect there'll be another Tanzania survey out very shortly. The y axis is age. It ranges in my, um, I selected from 17 to 20, so that you could see the full range here. Um, the X axis is time and includes six DHS survey years. So as I'm sure you know, the international community is interested in ending child marriages, which tends to mean an increase in the average age at which women get married. You can see from the red line um, that women in the Northern highlands of Tanzania on average get married at later ages than women in the rest of the country. Tanzania might also point to the coastal region um, to show improvement. So this is an area that's made substantial, has seen a substantial increase in the average age of first marriage over time. So there's plenty of ways to create such a figure with IPMS DHS data. Um, today I'm going to talk about how to do it with Stata and Excel. Um, and I also wanted to just talk briefly about stat compiler. So in some ways, this figure might look similar to a stat compiler figure, and, in, and indeed it is somewhat similar. So stat compiler is a tool that ICF or, um, manages. It's available at statcompiler.com. And you can look at change over time. Uh, what stat compiler doesn't have is it doesn't usually have harmonized variables. And so 
the change that you're seeing might be due to a difference in who was asked the question or a difference in um, how the question was asked over time. And then the other thing about Stack Compiler is it doesn't have harmonized geography, so you would not be able to look at regions over time. And finally, for most variables, um, Stack Compiler will not allow you to calculate confidence intervals to see whether differences are statistically significant. Here's another example of a figure. This is um, that shows you how you can use confidence intervals or construct confidence intervals with IFMS DHS. So this is the percentage of women with a say and how their earnings are spent. And I'm comparing two age groups of women, women who are in their 20s and women who are in their 30s. The red line is the women who are in their 20s. The black line is women who are in their 30s. We see that this is available, as you saw on the website, from four survey years, 96, 2004, 2010, and 2015. Um, the confidence interval allows us to see that there actually was a significant difference between 20 and 30 year olds in 1996, where um, older women, perhaps because they had more status in the household, were, had more ability to say how their earnings were spent. Now, it looks like that may have flipped in 2004, but in fact, by looking at the confidence intervals, we can see that there's no statistically significant difference here. Um, that these are, you would have to reject the hypothesis that these are different and say that they are probably about the same. And by the time we get to 2015, they certainly are the same. All right, so let me tell you how I created these very briefly. So first you create the data extract and you saw how that worked. You go to dhs.ifms.org, select all the Tanzania samples, select the integrated geography, then select age at first marriage, and women has a stay in spending her earnings. And then as you saw, the other variables are pre-selected. Um, then this is the STATA analysis that I used, and I can um, share this STATA analysis with a, an email um, after uh, to all of the people who are participating today. And we will also post this in the, um, the help PDF that goes along with this webinar when it's posted on the website. But basically what I'm doing in my STATA analysis here is taking three, uh, four different steps. Start by getting the variables just how you want them. And this will vary, of course, by which variables you're choosing to examine. Um, for this example, the harmonized variable names were really long. Um, and for a figure, that's not going to work for my purposes. And so I changed the names of the variables to make them shorter. Um, if this figure appeared in a journal article or report, I would include more detailed information in the text, of course. Next, and this is very important, I define the missing values. This doesn't happen automatically with IFMS data, so don't forget this step. If you did, for example, in this case, you it would look like there were some women who got married at the age of 99, and your averages would be way, way too high. So very important. Also very important is weighting. Um, this is how you set the weights using IFMS DHS data, which is very comparable if you've used this, the, um, original D, the original DHS data, except this will work for pooled data. Um, it's a, I'm making standard choices here and choosing linear, linearized um, as an option. And this single unit centered is important if you want to calculate confidence intervals. Otherwise, it's going to drop some of the clusters and that's going to give you some problems when you calculate standard errors. And then finally, I do the calculation, which is really quite simple. I apply the weight with SVY and then I take the mean of age at first marriage over the integrated regions and the survey year. Next, I export results to Excel and there's lots of different ways to do this. Uh, I um, And so I'll just mention them here and you can pick these or something else that you like. You can simply copy the state output, paste it into Word, clean it up, save it as a text file and import it into Excel. Or there's a couple of commands in Stata, including put Excel and outrig to. Um, this is like a regression equation because you're um, looking at the means over two independent variables. Um, and that will directly import it into Stata. Personally, I actually, when it's a simple analysis like this, prefer the first option. 
um, but you may have other um, preferences. The next thing you do now that the data is in Excel is you reformat it. Uh, so the line across the top is the survey years. This is um, age at first, women's age at first marriage, the means for that by the regions, which are in the first column. And so each cell is one of those means. Um, and uh, the, very, the data when I first got it into Excel didn't look exactly like this, so I constructed this table. All right, and then you simply use the Excel chart features to create your figure. All right, um, let's see if we have any questions now. Yes, we do have some more questions. Um, one question is, um, are we planning to include uh, additional kinds of DHS surveys in future? Um, you mentioned that we're doing the continuous standard and um, interim DHS surveys, but um, uh, some researchers are interested in the MIS, AIS, and SPA surveys. Do you want to take that, Liz? Yeah, sure. Um, well, we are going to be up for renewal next spring. We're going to be submitting a renewal grant to the National Institutes of Child Health and Development. And uh, one of the things that we're pondering is whether we should add the M MIS and AIS and other surveys. Um, that will probably be weighed against uh, adding more countries and more standard DHS for more countries. And so that's kind of the balance that we're doing. <clears throat> Ultimately, we absolutely want to get all of these, all of these DHS surveys into IPOMS DHS, and we recognize the value of that. And if you have thoughts on which you prefer, do let us know, and that will help us when we're writing up our renewal grant. Another question is, um, is there a list or a summary uh, page showing which variables are integrated? And I'm going to tackle that one. Um, we have over 15,000 integrated variables currently in IPHMS DHS. So um, currently the best way to do this is uh, to use the, figure out broadly what topic um, a, um, uh, a variable falls within and use the drop down menu. Um, we also have a, a search feature and you can enter if it's a, a standard variable name you can enter the, um, the, either the DHS um, original standard variable name or um, our name for a variable, um, which is more mnemonic, um, to find something there. And, and um, I, I think we're, um, you know, I know it can be a little frustrating to use the drop down menus, but on the other hand, uh, a list of you know, here's 17,000 variable names and labels is a little overwhelming too. So um, that's that's how you do that. Um, we also yeah, have I a use a combo of uh, search function and drop down menus, um, and and find that it's not too hard to find the variables. Oh, well, there's yeah, that reminds me. There's also if I could just interject one thing there, Miriam. Um, when you're on the variable selection pages, uh, so like you have all the decision-making variables there, if you look over in the top left, and I'm out of the website now, but if you look in the top left, you'll see um, two plus signs together. And if you click on that, you'll be able to add all of those variables at once to your data extract, and that's, that's also very useful. Sorry, Miriam, you go ahead. Oh, sure, we also have a question about um, pooling the data. Do you need to um, download separate data sets and then uh, combine them, or uh, how do you pool the data with IPMS DHS? Oh no, that's exactly what you don't have to do with IPMS DHS. The data comes all pooled and harmonized and um, with just the variables that you want. So there's no, we've done all the integration and harmonizing for you. So if you click um, all the Tanzania surveys, you're going to get those variables that you selected for all the Tanzanian surveys and they're all going to have the same, each variable is going to have the same name and it's going to be available for each of those surveys. We also have a question about um, potentially harmonizing the mixed geography with the DHS regional geography and maybe you can share the good news about uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, thanks, Miriam. And thanks for that question. What Miriam's talking about in terms of good news is that she and I are also um, principal investigators on the new grant to harmonize the mix data. And for those of you who aren't familiar with mix, mix is uh, data that is um, organized by UNICEF um, and they provide support for the mix surveys in lots of countries. And lots of those countries aren't available um, in the DHS. So it's a nice complement to the DHS, but it also asks some new questions. So um, yeah, we're very excited about that. In terms of harmonizing the geography, uh, I think that that is something that's probably down the road. The, my understanding is that the mixed geography is a little less, um, you get less geography information in mix than you tend to get for DHS. So they tend not to give you cluster information. And so that's something that we'll be dealing with. We have a question about whether the DHS data allows you to uh, analyze very small um, regions such as um, districts or wards within a region. And um, I'll just note here that with the DHS data, we like everyone else uh, start with the public use files um, created by the DHS program. So there's only the level of detail in IPM DHS that there is in the original DHS files. And there um, they try to, um, they rarely go below the um, broad regional first administrative level um, in terms of <clears throat> uh, the geographic variables um, beyond the GPS sample clusters, which I'm not going to get into right now, um, because they, um, they have to balance uh, having representative regions and um, a sample size and the budget they have to work with. So um, there's, there's not a lot of really low level detail. Okay, so we're, we'll move on now. And I think we'll have plenty of time for more questions at the very end here. Um, but I did want to talk about resources for other geography, um, other geography related analyses with IPMS DHS. And this is somewhat related to the question that Miriam just answered. So one thing that we're looking forward to, um, well, actually, we already have at the most basic level, but we're going to be adding much more detail soon, is um, linking keys between IPMS DHS and censuses. Uh, so IPMS International is another project at the Minnesota Population Center um, that has censuses from 98 countries in many years and well over a billion person records. And IPMS DHS makes it easy to use the data from the census and link it to your DHS analysis. So what you would do is you would create a data extract at IPMS DHS, you would aggregate the census statistics at low levels of geography, and then you could link those variables um, in IPMS DHS, uh, in, uh, from IPMS International to IPMS DHS. I'll show you what this looks like, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the variable selection. All right, this is a map of Kenya, as you can see. And uh, what each of the orange shades reflects is the percentage of women employed within um, different census districts. The darker shades reflect greater levels of employment. Um, and then the dots on the map are DHS clusters. So if we just look at, for example, um, the region of Tayata Taveta, we see that the percentage of women working in this region is a value between 50 and 60%. We would have the actual percentage if we were using IPMS International. And you can see that there are six DHS clusters in that region. Um, so all the respondents in those clusters, you could assign a particular value. Um, oh, I should say what, what we have here is the percentage of women working. So the um, the 50 to 60 percent women working, women in the labor force, is uh, this middle category with the orange color. And so we would assign that particular value, say 54 percent, to all of the women or all of the households in these particular clusters. Um, and soon we're going to be having this at the uh, level two administrative level, which is, um, that's going to be happening in September. And so while for IPMS, using the original DHS data, you can't get into fine levels of geography, by linking to the censuses, 
you actually will be able to, at least at the contextual level, be able to attach small area geography information to women's records. Um, so that's one exciting thing that's um, already in IPUM's DHS to some extent and will be um, elaborated on more next month. The other thing that you might know about is our contextual variables, which have been in IPUM's DHS for about 18 months now. And uh, if you want more information on those, I recommend that you look at this article that Miriam and I and um, Sarah Garcia, Corey Culver, and Jordan Bordeaux um, published in Population and the Environment um, about a month ago, or, or I guess it was May, so it was a few months ago. Uh, and it gives you lots of information on those contextual variables, what they are and how to link them. And then if you are a GIS person and you want to actually make maps, um, that is a, a cool way to demonstrate um, regional differences. And as we, as I mentioned, the shapefiles are available under the geography and GIS link on the IPMS DHS homepage. And I also really recommend a, a webinar that Shula hosted last year that's called IPMS International Using Geographic Variables and Shapefiles. And if you're particularly interested in maps, her discussion of how to make maps starts around minute 40 in that uh, one hour webinar. All right, um, I think this is also, a, this is a good time to break for questions. Um, so do we have any additional questions right now? And then I'll talk about where we'll be heading next with IPMS DHS. Uh, Liz, I can pick up uh, some of the questions that uh, came in from your showing the cluster data to the IPMS International Census data. So I bet that there are some questions there. That'd be great. Uh, so the users are wondering that the GPS clusters are displaced. So how is it that, uh, how, how does it work? If it is displaced, then you are overlaying it on a boundary uh, map. So I can take that. So our process of doing it is we do draw a buffer uh, that, a, which is equivalent to uh, the two mile radius they have for the displacement and then the five. And then if the buffer is wholly within the administrative unit, we say that the probability of that cluster falling within the unit is so and so percentage. But if it's 50 50, then we kind of give a probability index where we say that we can only be, let's say, 50% sure that it's within unit X and or unit Y. But uh, the good thing is most of these probability indices were fairly high uh, because uh, second level administrative units in the census data for most countries were big enough and the buffers around the urban clusters were smaller than the displacement buffers around the rural areas. If, uh, right, and, and Shula, also when we're looking at this particular map where, where the regions are rather large, the DHS tries to not displace across borders, right? Yes, DHS will also not try to displace it across the regions, like the broader, big administrative regions. So that's our containers. So right. DHS already gives you the first administrative unit for all these clusters. So we keep it within that first level unit, but try to put yeah. it to the second level oh. unit. It listed. Right. And also I was gonna, oh, go ahead, Shula, sorry. Um, yeah. Okay, I was going to say that um, also, if you're looking for those linking keys, you can find those under the, the geography topic in IPAM's DHS, and then you'd find the same variable name under IPAM's International, and that becomes the linking key. So where you saw, where I showed you, there was single sample geography and integrated geography. Also in that drop down, there's the IPAM's International, IPAM's DHS linking keys. We have a I have to add. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll just add quickly that this is not available yet, but it will be coming soon. 
We have a general question about how do people get access to the IFMS DHS data? Um, what do they have to do to get access and are there IRB requirements? Okay, that's a good question. Um, you register for the um, DHS, for, you register for the DHS data, which includes the IPOMS DHS data on the DHS program website. So if you type into Google or whatever your search engine is, um, the DHS program data, it will take you to a link where you can register for the data. And then you'll be able to use that at dhs.ipums.org. And no, you don't have to have uh, IRB approval because ICF um, has already gotten, uh, has already dealt with confidentiality issues and uh, creates the data in such a way that it should be very, very difficult or impossible to de-identify individuals in the data. We also have a question about uh, whether we're going to be harmonizing the calendar data. Oh, yes, we will be. Um, that is coming out in September too, along with these linking keys. Oh, um, no, so we're actually. Oh, actually, I'm sorry, it's coming, coming out, out in January. Spring. That's sorry, right. coming out in the spring. Sorry, sorry. yes. I got ahead That's of myself there, Miriam. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> but uh, yes, we've done a lot of work on that, but we won't be releasing the calendar data until the spring. So there will be a lot of uh, new samples and uh, new geographic um, data and so on in September, but the calendar data will be available um, sometime in uh, spring. Okay, I think okay. we have time for one more question here. Um, there is a, a follow-up on that saying, what do you mean by harmonizing the calendar data? So uh, what we've been doing with the calendar data is um, transforming it into um, another unit of analysis where each um, observation is a woman month of exposure. And um, then um, uh, uh, creating a bunch of summary variables for a woman like, how many different kinds of um, contraception did she use and how many pregnancies did she use and how many have and how many uh, pregnancy terminations did she have and so on. Um, it's a little bit uh, um, difficult to summarize quickly, but um, it's uh, uh, basically um, uh, making it easier to use by making um, uh, for a woman each month um, a unit of, um, of um, exposure. Yeah, maybe I can jump in there for a second too and say, so, so stepping back, the calendar data um, are data that go back usually 60 months um, for each woman and they track her, contra her, her contraceptive use and her um, reproductive health in terms of pregnancies and births over time. Um, and so it's basically a, a way of kind of making a cross-sectional survey longitudinal. You can see what happened over the last five years for each woman. And uh, it's a great way to see what kinds of things might have happened that make a woman change her um, contraceptive use. So for example, are women who are using one particular method more likely to discontinue than uh, women who are using a different method? Um, and you can also look at just kind of how fertility operates. So if women are using this method um, continuously, how long is it uh, or how likely is it that they actually get pregnant sometime in the next six months or while they're on that method or something like that. So basically it's taking the DHS data and making it longitudinal. So it's a really exciting, um, really exciting development. We're excited to be putting it in IFMS DHS. Um, so I'm gonna, just quickly talk about, well, maybe we can take now. I think oh, I, I was just going to say that um, there are some kind of specific questions in here, um, for example, um, about a specific um, sample. Um, and we will try to follow up with people who had um, such specific questions uh, by email. Um, also, um, you can uh, send um, questions to um, user support, if I'm at uh, umn.edu. And uh, other questions that we didn't have time for, we'll try to put into that summary document that goes up along with the webinar. So thank you for supplying so many great questions, everybody. 
Yeah, and I just, in our last minute, um, want to tell you what's coming soon to IPAMS DHS. And of course, you already heard some of this, but uh, next month we'll have 14 more samples. Um, and we'll also have three new countries, including Chad, Liberia, and Sri Lanka. Um, we will, as, as you heard in detail from Shula, we'll have the finer tuned linking keys to IPAMS International. So currently we have those, but they're at a pretty gross level, a course level, and uh, now they'll be uh, linked specifically to clusters. We will be adding the calendar variables, kind of a longitudinal element as a new unit of analysis, and we'll also be adding couples as a unit of analysis. So thanks very much for joining us, and please send any questions or comments uh, to us at ipums at umn.edu. We are delighted that you could join us today, uh, and we hope you have a wonderful week.